first of all, I want to thank you for coming. Appreciate your attendance. And if you're here for the session, making an economic pivot for your city or county's best future, then you're in the right place. If you're not here for that session, you can still stay. You're still in the right place. Our presenters this morning will be Don Fisher, and who is on the far, my far right, and Will Ketchum, who will lead off the session. Don is the longest serving county manager in Osceola's history, serving as the chief executive officer, which is one of the top 10 fast and growing counties in the United States. For over 40 years of experience with local government, Don believes that the council manager structure is the most effective form of local government. Don is a graduate from the U University of Central Florida and has been recognized as CEO of the year by the Orlando Business Journal, among many other honors. If you will give a round of applause for Don, just to recognize. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we're going to be leading off with Mr. Will Ketchum. Uh, Mr. Ketchum is the president of North Star, a national place branding and making marketing, pardon me, company based in Jacksonville, Florida. He is a specialist in helping cities and counties share their most authentic, compelling narratives to drive economic development and create stronger futures. Will has been in the marketing and branding field for more than three decades and speaks regularly on the power of placemaking at state and national conferences. He is a graduate of Vanderbilt University and achieved his MBA at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Ladies and gentlemen, right. Mr. Will Ketchum, who will lead off this session. Thank you, Mark, and thank you all for being here. We, we appreciate you choosing this session. I think you're going to find it uh, very inspiring and informative and um, something that you can take back to your uh, city or county and, uh, and apply. And um, as, as Mark said, I'm Will Ketchum, the president of North Star. Um, we're here to really feature Osceola County's story, but I'll, I'll get us going. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, my colleague Robin Shatler here and Tyler Holder. We hope to meet you afterwards, but also want to acknowledge um, some of the Osceola County public administration professionals, uh, great ones like all of you. Um, here this, this weekend. Uh, Beth Knight, the Chief Operating Officer of Osceola County, Tony Allure, the Deputy County Manager, and Shalani Prine, the Communications Director, Mark Pino, the Public Relations Officer, and Donna Renberg is also here, another Deputy County Manager. So glad to have them here. And then as we get into Q&A, we're going to let them supply most of the answers because this is, this is their story. So, you know, what we have um, titled this session is making an economic pivot for your city or county's best future. You know, the, your economy, there's so many issues you're managing, but your economy undergirds everything, right? Because the quality of jobs, the depth of investment in your community is what really sets the foundation for everything. And um, we're in the business of helping people position for that economic future they need to keep that tax base healthy and keep the community moving forward to improve quality of life and deliver the high level of services that all of you want to deliver as public officials. So we look forward to telling this story. Ultimately, you know, bottom line kind of thing, this is a discussion about future-proofing your community. Regions, cities, counties are facing economic transitions. So I'd, I'd like a raise of hands. How many of your communities, if you come from a community that's incorporated less than 50 years ago, raise your hand. Okay, just a few. And now those who were incorporated more than 50 years ago, so yeah, most of you. So what that means is likely your economies have transitioned, right? Because look how many cycles and how much innovation has occurred, how globalization has occurred in just the last 50, not to mention 75 years. So every economy has to adapt to move forward. We look in Florida at you know, important uh, industries like agriculture, which have been foundational uh, to, this, to this state, also tourism, but how those face heavy competition 
and some wage suppression. So every community has to think about how we're going to diversify our job base to create economic resilience. And I think that's the theme today is economic resilience. Things like COVID happen, uh, economic cycles happen, so you've always got to be planning ahead and be sort of running toward that economic change, uh, not from it. So that is uh, today's you know, sort of theme and, and discussion topic. So what's happening in the macro? There's so much in employment growth in the knowledge sector that manual labor communities, i.e. Uh, agriculture, and some of the things we talked about, which are still critical and viable, uh, but the, the rate of growth and therefore the rate of opportunity for your residents in the future will be uh, in the knowledge sector, inclusive of technology and all those factors. Looking at a few just big macro themes, of course globalization. So globalization has made the world smaller and a smaller world has made a more competitive uh, world. And these are things that you know, jurisdictions, municipalities didn't have to think about not too long ago, but now it's, you know, everyone's got to put their best foot forward to fight for their fair share of what's going on globally. And that cross-sector work that globalization has brought about also drives the need for, for varied skill sets in a community. Clustering. So this is an interesting stat. 20 counties account for 50 percent of U.S. business growth. Two decades ago, that was 125 counties. So we're proponents of regionalization. Some of you might be in more remote locations. Some are closer to an MSA, and you might participate in that economy. If you don't, or if you are more remote, you have to figure out your niche for economic growth, right? But clustering is, is, a, is a reality. Technology, of course, so digital skill intensity ultimately it equates with higher mean wages and less susceptibility to automation. So you probably, this is not today's topic, you probably have a lot of workforce development programs going on in your community. Those have to go hand in hand, right, with job attraction. Attracting those jobs of the future requires training your people to be ready for them. And then, of course, demographics. And today is a great story of, of diversity uh, because that's what's happening. It's a great example of that. It's happening uh, across the country, but the labor force growth is driven by more diverse populations, some of whom have lower educational attainments. So how can a community bring those skill sets up and work toward that work workforce development and find the right jobs for those members of, of the community? So ultimately, the question becomes, how can a municipality transition its economy and create broad-based prosperity because every one of your residents wants a shot at something better, right? So if we look back, however, inclusive growth has been difficult. Only eight in 100 cities in the past um, few decades since the last recession have achieved that inclusive growth. What does that mean? Well, you can see economic growth through certain pockets of your community. You can see rising productivity, perhaps among some of your major employers. But are there higher wages and higher unemployment across the board in your community? That's what's been elusive, and that's where Osceola County fought hard, and starting over a decade ago, to plan for this, the outcome we're going to talk about today. And it's always a work in progress, but the progress has been amazing. So with that, let me give you a little backdrop on Osceola County before Don comes up to tell us more. So, you know, you're from all over the state. You probably have a vague sense that Osceola County is in the center of the state, and it is. And here it is right south of where we sit today. So there you see a sizable county. Uh, Kissimmee, I think we have some friends from Kissimmee here, it is a city everyone knows, and St. Cloud as well, great towns. And you can see also the county's geography is pretty, is, is deep north to south. And then Celebration, which is a sort of Disney-related property, uh, is in Osceola County. So often when you visit the parks, you're in Osceola County and you may not even know it. So um, as a result, a, a big part of the labor force in Osceola County has been tied to the tourism economy. And, and that is both a good thing, but also something that has to be you know, pivoted from and diversified around. You want to embrace that economy and then also supplement it um, with a cushion in other categories. So 1,500 square miles, 
The population is 420,000 to give you a frame of reference. Not much more than a decade ago, that was in the 200s. So a real high rate of growth in Osceola County. We're gonna talk about that in a moment. It's also um, majority minority. So 56% of the population in this county um, is Hispanic. A beautiful county. Uh, what people sometimes miss uh, in driving through on their vacation are the incredible natural assets that this county possesses. Lake Toho Pecaliga, Lake Toho we'll call it today, uh, is just a beautiful spot and um, is, is sort of the, um, the trophy of all the many natural assets, trails, and hiking areas that you can experience in Osceola County. Incredible municipal campus. This is the oldest uh, county courthouse in the state of Florida, beautifully preserved, but also right next door to a really modern, impressive municipal campus. Uh, this is in Kissimmee. And just to give you a feel for the place, if you're less familiar, I mentioned agriculture. Ranching, cattle specifically, is a principal economic pillar of Osceola County. Again, that's a great thing because they're one of the top two or three counties in the state in agriculture, cattle specifically but it also means that diversification is important because that's a, that's a tough market um, and a very specialized market. The county possesses a number of small towns that uh, really belie this idea that it's just right below Disney World. There's these pockets of, of beautiful little small towns that have that feel that many of you might have if you're from smaller communities, but also Highway 192. This is where some from the outside might say, this is the tourism strip. And, um, and so it, it's sort of emblematic of the tourism economy uh, here or down in, in Osceola County. So notice that picture, Magic Castle. Um, you're going to see it in a moment in this very brief video clip. We're going to share with you in a, a way that is probably over-dramatizes the situation, but there, there was a movie called The Florida Project that came out about six years ago. Has anyone heard of The Florida Project? Yeah. Uh, a, a quite well done film. It, it was more of an independent film that won some awards at Sundance, that kind of film. Not, not a summer blockbuster, but a very poignant and inspiring, uh, at times sad, but ultimately hopeful story uh, about people who were living at a, a lower quality of life inside that sort of tourism strip of Highway 192. And again, I offer this very broadly only to portray what can be if your economy is not planning for the future. So let's take a look and you'll get a feel for that. Thanks for calling the Magic Castle, Amber. Mm. Yeah, you sure do. $38 mm. a night. <laughs> okay, I warned you, one drip and you're out. Oh, come on! Out now. It's gonna melt. It's mountain inside, too. But Bobby... Out. Thank you very much. You're not welcome! The man who lives in here gets arrested a lot. These are the rooms we're not supposed to go in. But let's go anyway. Could you give us some change, please? The doctor said we have asthma and we gotta eat ice cream yeah. right away. Here you go. Hey, Lee, got a situation here. Open up. It's only second week of the summer, and there's already been a dead fish in the pool. We're trying to get it back alive. Water blooms thrown at tourists. Boobies! Boobies! I failed as a mother, Moni. Yeah, Mom, you're a disgrace. New job? Yeah. If you're working, who's looking after Moni? You're not my father. I don't want to be your you father. You can't treat me like this. You don't think everybody knows what's up, Haley? Everybody. She's about to cry. I can always tell when adults are about to cry. Why is my mommy on? They're just talking. They gotta figure something out. I love you too. 
again, just a singular and small snapshot of life on that, that strip, um, but a, a poignant and, and, and dramatic symbol of, uh, of adversity that every, every county, every municipality wants to bring their people out of. Um, so the rest of the story is quite compelling. This county, among the fastest growing in the country. Anyone in Florida experiencing population growth, by the way? <laughs> yeah, I know that's a big part of the stress in your work right now. Osceola grew at a rate of 45% between 10 and 20, and 55% growth is predicted through 2040. So that's over 600,000 people um, in a county that not long ago was, you know, in the 150 to 200 range. So you're all feeling that, uh, but it, it gives you a, a sense that this is um, a a real powerhouse county right here in the heart of Florida. The agricultural economy is significant at 12.8 billion, and it's also a top 10 tourist tax collector. It is known as the vacation home capital of the world. So that's that other leg of the stool, the tourism economy we've talked about. So if you hear about people going to vacation homes, most of them are in Osceola. You can rent them and enjoy your vacation in a single family home with smart sensors and all types of innovations. So, and that's one of the key stories we want to tell today is that the innovation was not just in, in the technology space, but also in ranching and in the hospitality and tourism world. So, but this was the statistic that I think drove leaders in Osceola County to say, we've got to change the course we're on. Back in 2010, the per capita income per the census in this county was around 27,000 versus a state level of 38,000. So that became the signal that it was time to set a new course for economic diversity and economic resilience. And uh, I'm excited for Don to come and, and share that story with you. Uh, thank you, Will. Good afternoon, peers. It's a great opportunity to come in and talk with you about what Will just presented and what Osceola County did. Not necessarily prescriptive for any one of you, but uh, glad to share what our experience was in terms of diversifying our economy from agriculture and tourism, construction when we're building into another leg of the stool. And I could uh, elaborate to the point about tourism. We're, Osceola is blessed. We've got part of Disney World. We have Champions Gate, Reunion, Margaritaville, uh, Gaylord Palms. We've got a lot of great assets. We have the West 192 corridor, 35,000 units of vacation rental homes. But during COVID, we were at 31% unemployment. We we're the second highest in the country because we were so reliant upon tourism. Uh, so we needed to do other things. So you can see we're part of the Orlando, Kissimmee, Sanford metropolitan statistical area. And we're probably not dissimilar to a lot of you in the room that we're a bedroom community, we're an outlier. So any of you that are, are near a city and you're one of the, uh, the suburbs type of situation, you get a lot of the housing but not a lot of the jobs. And as a result of that, we are about 0.4 jobs uh, for every one household, when an optimal model would be about one to one. Uh, so we're at a big deficit there. So in 2012, the 10 year story, uh, the county commission through strategic planning, and uh, I was a county manager at the time, and uh, Beth Knight and Donna Renberg were, were part of the team as well. I uh, sat down with the county commission, and, and one of the four objectives we came up with was to grow and diversify the economy. And two components came out of that uh, in particular, uh, out of that strategic plan, I'd like to, to talk about that. I'm gonna break it down into two segments. One is infrastructure and the other is gonna be education, which I'll, I'll cover a little bit later. To be sure that we got it right through strategic planning, we did something called a cluster analysis. So if, if I, to give you any advice about how you might approach it differently, we, we discovered that buying companies to come and relocate here doesn't work. Uh, especially when uh, oftentimes those companies fail, they leave. I'll give a local example, the Sanford Burnham Institute at, at Lake Nona. Millions of $300 million were invested into that facility and now they're gone and there's really nothing left of what was originally here before. So uh, we did a cluster analysis, came up with seven things that we felt that in central Florida, we can grow and diversify those businesses. Anything from technology to agriculture and, and sports and, and so forth. Uh, but what we came up with, uh, in particular, the one that stands out, which is important and tells our story, is manufacturing and research. And that made it very important for us to be able to re react quickly. So, uh, from an infrastructure perspective, 
we think Osceola does that uh, economic development should take the form of infrastructure. Not dissimilar to any one of you that have taken on a capital project. For us, we use the example is uh, you widen a road. Widening a road these days is anywhere from 50 million to 100 million plus. Uh, so maybe delay one of those infrastructure projects and build it into something that would attract companies or businesses to your community versus trying to pay them through uh, the old QTI system or $50,000 for manufacturing incentives or those types of things because they don't really work because everybody else does that. What they do look for is that a community that's ready to accept you, you've got the zoning in place, the infrastructure there, and, and they're ready to go and roll because time to market is very important to many of these companies. If you can beat another market by three months, that means money in their pocket and, and very important to them. So in 2014, the Orlando Economic Development Commission and the University of Central Florida, the High Tech Corridor, came to Osceola County with a proposal of something that they were working on. And they wanted to build in Central Florida a semiconductor manufacturing facility around smart sensors. I, we were a bit surprised by the offer. We knew they'd been, they'd been discussing it for a couple years in another county just to the north, but politically they couldn't work it out with them. And in a matter of six hours, because we did the cluster study and we had the strategic plan, within six hours I gave them a letter committing 20 acres and $30 million. Now that's, any of you that's a CEO or, or a city manager or county manager or deputy know that that's a big deal to submit a letter like that without having a county commission meeting or a, a meeting of the elected officials. But again, my advice and preparation is that you get to the point where you're trusted and allowed to do that because the guidance was given for us in 2012, so in 2014, we knew that we could move forward with the project. So what they asked us to do was to build a 100,000 square foot clean room. Uh, uh, microelectronics, fabrication, all the, all the things that Chip Sack's talking about right now was to, to build this clean room, and at the time, uh, they were gonna put a bunch of money toward it on top of our 30 million, uh, and that, uh, I'll address that in a moment, that didn't necessarily work out. The idea at the time was to work on smart sensors. Uh, sm sensors are in every device that you can, you know, they're in cars, they're in your phone, they're, you, you name it, there's sensors all over the place. Uh, and there's gonna be billions of them throughout the world on the internet of things and the internet of everything. Uh, that story ended up changing and we ended up going to a different product line called advanced packaging. And simply, advanced packaging is you take the green board from your computer and it's got all the chips on it and the little components. You throw away the, the green board and you start connecting the chips directly together. They're lighter, more efficient, more resilient to radiation, which is important for the country, for the space, industry, and war, and vehicles, uh, and, and several other things. The vehicle to which they got there was uh, we established, we didn't go to it blind, we established something called the International Consortium for Advanced Manufacturing Research, the worst name ever created. Uh, it was done by the University of Central Florida, but we did sign on to it. We rebranded it as Bridge, so you hear me talk about Bridge, that's really our, it's a not-for-profit consortium specializing in developing the semiconductor industry. What we did is we modeled it after Austin, Texas. Austin, back in the late 80s, uh, created its economy based on addressing uh, uh, Texas Instruments and, uh, and other companies' issues and the federal government's issues that Japan, at the time, was taking over the microelectronics industry. Hundreds of million dollars were invested. Austin blew up and blooms the way that it is today, really known for the high-tech area. The challenge was for, when it comes to infrastructure, I, a lot of local governments and city, et cetera, is they'll look at, it, they'll take a site and they'll create an industrial park and they'll put the plans on the shelf and hope that people come. I think you need to be more proactive about it and not reactive and, and be aggressive. So our proactive side of it is we established a community uh, called Neo City. It's a 500 acre tech park uh, that has a series of buildings put on it right now, but it's located in the heart of the Orlando Kissimmee Sanford MSA. I, and from a connectivity standpoint, it's, it's really strategically well located. Uh, we're about 20 minutes from the Orlando International Airport, we're close to a Sun Rail line, that's our commuter rail line, close to Disney, and really close to the Space Coast, and there's a big connection with the space industry and semiconductor manufacturing as well. So this is an old picture, but it shows you under construction. I think that we are the only local government in the country that owns a semiconductor fabrication facility. 
Uh, we ended up investing in this infrastructure. The 30 million jumped to 85 million. Uh, but we felt that to really make a difference, that that's something that we needed to do. I know it's not an easy thing for many to, to, to take on. So if it's 5 million, 10 million, 200 million, depending on the size of your government, uh, we think that's the right way to go versus paying a company to come that could pick up and leave. Because the difference is, is that nobody can take this building from the county. We will own this in perpetuity. So if a company picks up and leaves, we'll find the next one that actually happened. The agreement we had was with the University of Central Florida, was going to operate the uh, fab for 30 years and bring in 250 jobs that was going to build this cluster. I, when I negotiated the agreement on behalf of the county, I was like, there is no way the second largest university in the United States would ever fail an agreement. Well, they did. And in 2020, they closed down the doors. And we we're in, in complete panic, because you know, as, as leaders of your community, when you stick your neck out there to cause something like this to happen, they're going to be looking to you to, okay, that was the dumbest idea ever. Uh, but what ended up, ended up happening was a, a bit of a blessing in that uh, we had seven companies come forward, and I'll talk about a moment, the, the company that took University of Central Florida's place. Also on the site is a 100,000 square foot Class A office building uh, that is actually, that will net net profit to the county of $750,000 a year. We changed the market. We're charging $28.50 triple net lease, which is about $3 higher than the market with the justification that how, where else you're going to be like 100 feet from the front doors of a fabrication facility. So there's three uses on site. Uh, the Center for Innovation is the fabrication facility that I referred to, which has been open since 2017. And that's an actual picture and not a rendering. Uh, and that is operated by Skywater Technology. So Skywater Technology is a Minnesota company that's been around for 2017 and before that it was Cyprus. Uh, they have 500 employees in Minnesota. They've expanded here. They're going to build 240 jobs and have taken over all the obligations for the Center for Innovation. Uh, Skywater's offices are actually in the OC building, which is the middle one you show here. Uh, we have IMEC a nanotechnology company. IMEC is a Belgium company with 5,500 employees throughout the, throughout the world. They're considered the leading edge experts when it comes to nanotechnology. Their first U.S. headquarters is in Kissimmee, Florida. So by building this infrastructure, we only have Skywater Technology. We've got one of the world's most premiered uh, designers of, of nanotechnology. Uh, and then probably the, the, let me go back. And probably the most impressive facility on site is Neo City Academy. It is a magnet public high school. Public high school. It is now rated, it's been open for six years. There are 200 graduating seniors that are going to Harvard, MIT, and in the work industry out of Osceola County. And I'll explain why that's pretty significant in, in a moment when I get to the education part. There are high school interns that are working for Skywater Technology and receiving a paycheck. Uh, and get a chance to work in a clean room. So if you come from a community where you know tourism and agriculture, now you're working in a clean room, now you're the number one school in the county, you're the number two school in Central Florida, that makes a, a big difference for a, a small investment. But as a public high school that our school district, we gave them the land, they built the school right outside the door of the Center for Innovation. So back to Skywater Technology, IMEC, uh, we have Tokyo uh, Micron, Seuss, uh, several other companies that are working out of there. Why would you choose Florida? You don't think about Florida being in the semiconductor realm. We actually have more semiconductor jobs in the state of New York. Certainly California and Texas have more, but that's very significant. We have 5% of all those jobs. One reason is that we've got a pretty robust education system. This slide doesn't show up, but within 120 miles of central Florida, the Neo City, are uh, uh, 500,000 university students. So the access to that knowledge base in the Space Coast really makes Central Florida, and for that matter, all of Florida, more attractive than you might think. And there's a lot of federal programs that you could align, whether you're a city or a county, with the federal funding that's flowing through that could be pharmaceuticals, could be in the semiconductor realm. It's a, just many things that you might be looking to take advantage of leveraging those federal funds, which is something that we ended up doing. The master plan that we did also calls for, you know, when I say this, I say this with the passion that 
We're in Kissimmee and St. Cloud. We're in Osceola County. What I didn't say before in his earlier slides is that, like many of you in your bedroom community, you're the afterthought of the main city that's kind of around you. So we're, we're always the afterthought to the city of Orlando. And from the city of Orlando, you've got Orange County, and then it was Seminole. Because I, I, I can say that about Seminole, because I worked there for 21 years and left as a deputy manager. And we always looked at Osceola and these regional boards as, you know, let's line up with our two governments and we'll get whatever we want. So we wanted to change that reputation and change what we were, what we were about. And many of you might end up feeling that same way. But to have IMEC here, Skywater Technology, the Department of Defense grants that we have, and then uh, Frank Siami and Edward Minskoff. So these two companies are significant developers in Manhattan. Edward Minskoff is one of the top 200 collectors of private art in the United States. He uh, collects the uh, cause, K-A-W-S, and the, the coon. So if you, in Battery Park in New York, there's a building there, I think it's Aster, and it's got the large red balloon looking, rabbit looking thing all wrapped up. That's, that's a $38 million piece of art that Mr. Minskoff owns, who's looking at developing this master plan in Kissimmee, Florida, in Neo City. So they've hired shop, uh, the, which you see in, the, in a, this is their vision of what Neo City should look like. That's a performing arts center that we're now working on. Probably about 100 to 125 million dollar performing arts. It's part of this mixed use city center that will complement the other 225 acres of economic development. And just to give you a feel of what they envision and the change uh, to what Osceola County may end up looking like. So there's, there's, we've made progress. So the state of Florida and the federal government has started recognizing Neo City in this 10 year effort. Uh, Governor DeSantis awarded six million dollars to the county to construct one of the roads through Neo City. Uh, uh, Neovation Way. Prior to that, then Governor Scott awarded $5.8 million for Neo City Way as well. But a, a bigger aspect that we went after uh, was something called the Build Back Better Regional Challenge. I'm not sure if any, may, any one of you may be familiar with that. It is a federal program through the Economic Development Administration of a billion dollars that local governments and tribes could compete for to accelerate and diversify their economy. Uh, it was a long competition out of 550 applications in the United States, and 17 of which being from Florida. Uh, only 21 were awarded. Osceola County was one of the 21. We received $50.8 million to advance the semiconductor manufacturing, and we're the only one out of Florida that received uh, any monies at all. So if you're looking for outside affirmation that you're doing the right thing, that was saying, okay, there's other people looking at us that says that what we're doing uh, is gonna diversify our economy and we're down the right pathway and not any pipe dream. And I suggest that you could do the same as well. So the vision for Build Back Better is the six awards that we received. Mostly it was to finish out the clean room that we have at the Center for Innovation and to establish this as a center of excellence for what I referred to before, advanced packaging, getting rid of the green boards and connecting microelectronics together. Our coalition was the Orlando Economic Partnership, believe it or not, even though the University of Central Florida did abandon us back in 2020, we had since made amends and they were part of our coalition application uh, with much better agreements than we ever had before. Uh, bridge that not-for-profit consortium, our Semitech that I referred to in, in Osceola County. We also have coalition partners, uh, a lot of companies here and, and local governments that will further our, our efforts. So it's a pretty diversified group. And as I'd indicated, we did receive that award in addition to build back better of that long process when we were in uh, Washington, D.C. as part of the training that they had before the award we came across the National Science Foundation's Innovations Engine. They said that they read our Build Back Better application, that we need to apply for NSF. NSF is $160 million on top of the $50 million awarded over a 10-year period. We've made it through the third round. We give our virtual presentation. We're down to, I don't recall if we're down like 13 national applications. But again, Kissimmee, to be in the semiconductor run uh, with the National Science Foundation, that's great. We have an application with the Department of Defense for Project Cornerstone. That's $285 million for advanced packaging. We already received $27 million for the Industrial Base Analysis and Sustainability Program. More DOD stuff. Uh, 
And then the CHIPS Act came out. The CHIPS Act is $55 billion, $5.5 billion of it being for advanced packaging. And we're, we're on the radar both of the state of Florida and for the federal government. I keep repeating these things and going over to that. If you find a lane that your city or your county can be in, and if you're persistent and you keep after it, it, does, it takes some time really to, to get through these things, but uh, it's persistence. Don't give up, uh, just keep working at it. So the philosophy of building infrastructure, we're, Osceola has three lines, our three stations on the Point Siena SunRail line, our commuter rail line. And any, to, to know the value of SunRail isn't necessarily the commuter standpoint, it's the transit-oriented development that gets created at the stations and the tax base that it creates. One of those stations was gonna be converted to a residential development, which was counter to any reason why you, to invest in a SunRail line. And uh, we decided to buy the SunRail station. So we bought 82 acres of the site and we're trying to develop it for a mixed use development and economic, an economic development site. So I mentioned before about infrastructure and then education. So I had a conversation with the county commissioner probably about in 2010 and 11 in his office, and he says something like, I think we should stop all this competing for companies and we need to invest in education. I said, yes, education and infrastructure. So that was kind of where that, that deal came together. But with regard to education and workforce development, Osceola was 61st out of 67 counties in the state of Florida for post-secondary education. 61st out of 67, and here we are in the MSA. We're a minority majority community. What I guess and, and, and hypothesize is that somebody 18, 19, 20 goes from high school to Disney, I'm sure I said Disney, goes to one of the theme parks or hospitality, pr pretty decent paycheck at that point in your life. But when you're 27, 28 and you got a family, it, it is no longer. And the point of showing the, the Florida project is that when we're dealing with the federal government, there is a presumption that why would you guys need money for semiconductors? You're in Orlando. Everything is great in Orlando. And it dawned as we're trying to talk about the story, I said, yeah, but we've got families living in hotels. We have 2,000 families living in hotels on West 192. So we need to do more. We need to invest in the infrastructure and education. So in 2022, we intentionally approached ARPA in, in, in a very kind of basic way. We wanted to do projects that would change our community and make a difference because it's once in a, once in a lifetime, really, money's for a local government to make a difference. So we didn't go out and buy the face mask kits and here's your thousand dollars for hand sanitizer and whatnot. We set aside our $63 million, was it? About, 60, about $73 million. We set aside $73 million for a variety of programs. One of which was $12 million for education. So in 2022, the county commission voted to pay for every graduating high school senior to either get a full scholarship from Valencia College or the Osceola Technical School. Five years within which to do it, no uh, requirement to go full time. And that turned us from 61st out of 67 to 19 out of 67. It increased the enrollment rate by 50%. That's what we do with the ARPA funds. It works so well, and we think we're investing in our workforce for the future. We took eight and a half million dollars the next year of general fund, and then some CARES funds, right? And uh, did the same thing. So every graduating high school senior from 23, and now we're gonna look at doing it for 24. And it's really garnering the, the attention of how you can build a workforce. So what we've been doing is, from a DEI perspective or a workforce development perspective, every application that we put in now for federal funding, we, we check a lot of boxes in that regard. And, uh, and we just think that's a, we thought that was a good, good use of those funds and the kids are super excited. Go into a high school sometime and tell everybody to get their free scholarship. There's tears from the kids, tears from the parents and whatnot. It's fantastic. So a bit of a, of a victory. This isn't necessarily Osceola County. This is Central Florida. But uh, I don't know if Will covered, there's a, a thousand jobs being created a week right now in the Orlando Kissimmee Sanford MSA. It is the second highest rate in the United States. Uh, recently, Orlando MSA surpassed the tourism and hospitality jobs. We now have more professional jobs, business and professional jobs in the Central Florida area than we do tourism jobs. So that's the success and the victory, thanks.
Thank you, Don. So that's a cool story. That is a story of vision, belief, uh, persistence, and ultimately action. And um, as we wrap, Don's going to share a few takeaways for you on, you know, what are the keys to success. But as Osceola County, you know, just to sort of end, end the story, uh, plan this bold new future and, and position themselves for a better, more diversified economic future, they realized that the first impression of their communications and their brand uh, didn't represent where they were going. And um, I want to end with just the story of telling this evolved uh, narrative around the county's plans for the future. So we'll start with what is actually a very beautiful and well-crafted county seal. This was created somewhere in the early to mid 80s. You can see that Epcot is uh, shining on the upper right. And you can see all the things we talked about today that make this county so special. I'm sure you have this same sort of diversity in your places, but of course, agriculture and cattle ranching, the lakes and the, the historic boat, and then of course the municipal facility, all wrapped around orange blossoms and, and some you know sort of old authentic Florida history. Really, really pretty compelling. Uh, our first recommendation to the county was keep it. It's, it's beautiful and it should be an important part of your history that's preserved. It belongs in your chambers for council and or commission and um, it should be on your official legal documents. So that brand doesn't go away, but what needed to happen when you think about an innovation in a place like Neo City, you can see that there's a marked inconsistency in those two things, right? So that this older county seal doesn't reflect where Osceola County is going with its economy in the future. And that matters when you're at the table with an investor or a potential corporation thinking about bringing jobs to your location. So we went about a process of deep immersion all throughout the county, talking to residents, key stakeholders, focus groups, depth interviews, moving toward research outside the county as well to see how people perceive Osceola from afar. We moved toward a DNA strategy, sort of a blueprint for their brand. And then we created the brand identity, which we're um, wanting to share today with you. And then, of course, how do you put that brand to work? Brand action ideas to make, um, to make this thing work. And folks, th this was not a, like, we need a new logo feel good exercise. This was a very strategic exercise, again, around making that important first impression when you're at the table for jobs and investment, resident attraction, because that labor statistic, a thousand new jobs a week being created, we want folks to move to Osceola County and, and take those jobs. So all of this is, is built around those types of objectives. Um, the, the DNA strategy, that blueprint I mentioned, for enterprising individuals, and this is not a slogan or public language, this is strategic language, for enterprising individuals building a strong foundation today. Note today, there were things happening in Osceola County today, not just a futuristic uh, vision. Osceola County, the vacation home capital of the world, drives Central Florida forward. Osceola was ready and had already demonstrated they were taking a leadership role. So. Um, close allies with Orange County and Orlando, but saying, hey, in our own right, we're ready to lead this region forward to the leading edge of new ideas like sensor technology and advanced packaging and technology within uh, those vacation homes and in the ranching industry, in fact, um, and vibrant culture. So an important nod to the diversity, the rich uh, tapestry of different ethnicities that are a part of Osceola County now. So that was the sort of strategic platform from which we created the Osceola County brand, be first to what's next. And that is an invitation to individuals, to visitors, although this is not a tourism brand, they have a very effective uh, tourism uh, effort elsewhere, uh, but also importantly to the companies we want to come locate at that park, the Neo City campus, and, and say to them, um, yeah, you might see cows, you might see vacation homes, but we're on the leading edge of something very critical to the future of the national economy uh, with that technology we talked about. So be first to what's next, a bold invitation to come live and enjoy and work in Osceola County. 
what innovation looks like in the first place. So that's uh, reflecting that sensor technology, but also balanced by the incredible natural assets we talked about. This, this is um, Spanish, obviously, but it, what it says is you know, what you imagine Florida to be in the first place. So we're careful to preserve what makes Osceola County special in a historic sense is just a classic Florida locale with the natural assets, the water, and all the great lifestyle attributes. And uh, a look at how website and social media now is, is working and how the brand infuses into that, how the story uh, can translate from technology to also you know, kind of discovery and a, and a better quality of life, which is not just technology, but also those uh, natural assets. Um, these plans are underway and, and just getting <coughs> moving to build the brand into the built environment and the infrastructure of the county. So um, signaling to residents uh, the, the value and quality of their municipal services, but also signaling to those who come visit and consider job relocation, expansion, or investment uh, that this is a county um, that has its future in sight. And so you can see some of the entry signage. You know, it's tough in this region. You don't, all of you can relate. You're not quite sure when you've entered one uh, jurisdiction or the next. So uh, monument and entryway signage can be a helpful way to help people know kind of where they are and, and where they're coming into or leaving. And so you, you can see, of course, how the, the brand applies to a lot of materials um, for employees. And yeah, I'll tell you, this brand is, has a, a vital role in uh, staff recruitment as well, because uh, I think all of you face this tight labor market, and even though we're creating a lot of jobs in this region, there's not enough people to fill them. So you got to put your best foot forward with uh, a brand and a message that says we're going places. Come be a part of it. So we hope, and we're just getting going uh, with the brand launch over the last, you know, 12 to 18 months, that all this rich diversity of, of assets in this county is, is captured there and excited to see how uh, it takes Osceola County forward. But it really is a remarkable, uh, diverse uh, array of, of qualities that I'm sure you can relate to all the diversity of qualities in your community. And how do you bring that all together? Find that common denominator and tell your story uh, for the future you want. I'm gonna let Don sit where he is, but he helped us craft these keys to success for your municipality if you wanna go down this path of both vision and action. And um, Don, these are some of the things that you, you had mentioned that our audience would want to take away and um, you know, get your elected body to agree to move forward. I think it was an early step one, right? Yeah, and not necessarily from the, from the slide. If you're, my advice in it, right? Take it for what it's worth. You guys have as much experience as I do. But what I found is work for for Osceola, and, and mind you, when I became manager in 2010, it was a Republican board, and now it is a Democratic board. But even with these sig significant projects and, and ways to approach economic development, they have never changed or wavered in terms of what matters. You know, R&D is one thing. Uh, there's a, so, some tools I suggest that you use, whether it's economic development or, or anything along those lines, and that's strategic planning because it's an objective way to get them to agree to things that they might not agree to based on their political affiliations. And then once they give you that plan and you start getting a set of action plans out of it, you can, you've got your marching orders. And the way you manage with them is like, we have it's, it's on the action plan, or it's not in the action plan so I can't do it, and it becomes pretty effective. And then with that, look at doing the cluster analysis. You know, so often we're all competing against each other for the same thing. And that doesn't really necessarily work. Find out areas that you can legitimately grow. It's an expensive study. It cost us in 2011, I think is when we did it. It was about $400,000, so it's not a small undertaking. But you could potentially partner with a university that could do it at a much lower cost and help you, or maybe your re regional planning council could help out as well. Uh, when you have the cluster study, and then you, got, you have buy-in from the board, Economic development is not a, I try to emphasize that, is not a passive thing that you pursue. If you want it to happen, you really have to be proactive. And I probably spend 35% of my time as county manager uh, on economic development issues. I am absolutely blessed to have the best team in Florida, I think, that are really running the day-to-day -day operations to allow that economic development uh, research to happen. But I've been to 
China by myself to Beijing, trying to get a business to business market to the Washington Nationals at that Neo City site for 14 baseball games a year that we thought we decided wasn't really worth it at $140 million, which we're blessed to have uh, the Center for Innovation instead. To, to California, San Francisco at the Semitech Conference, I've been to Belgium, to the Netherlands, and it really takes that type of day to day engagement and trust from your elected body to go out and recruit companies. That's, that's really what it takes. Having zoned a piece of property and do a master plan and putting it on a shelf isn't going to bring you the, the, the companies. And finally, I, I just think that the paying companies to come here, uh, for, you know, for one thing, from a manufacturing and incentive perspective, Florida is nowhere near any of the other, many of the other states in, in the country between Tennessee, Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Texas, we just don't, we don't compete. So you got to figure out a way from a local perspective to make it work for you. What, uh, what we did is, is infrastructure, but something that you could do new is, again, there's so many federal funds out there and so many ways that you could align yourself for federal funds. Uh, we're, we're positioned, Osceola, to take in, you've got the, the $27 million from DOD, the 285 to the 160 to the 50.8, and hopefully we're going to be to a point where we can step away and then the project takes care of it itself. So that would be my counsel in terms of our advice and how you approach economic development at whatever level, at whatever level it works for you. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. I and said it without following the slides. Yeah, that's right. That. I think we've covered these four key takeaways. If you take notes, those are the, those are the keys. So thanks for listening. We'd like to hear from you now and um, open this to Q&A. And uh, Osceola County team would love to answer any questions. Hi, Dennis. Yeah, Robin's got a microphone here. My question is, uh, well, uh, suburban homes are being developed at such a rapid rate in Osceola County. We need the remaining undeveloped land needs to become county wildlife management areas because, you know, our, eco our natural ecosystems are disappearing just so developers can make profit and provide housing for uh, upper middle class to rich uh, people, f immigrants from the Northeast, which is, which they're kind of climate refugees, but they're also, you know, one example we can do instead is, you know, redevelop the Highway 192 corridor. We keep the important tourist attractions like uh, Medieval Times, Orange World, uh, and also Fun Spot, and uh, and yeah, redevelop it, and which will include public housing for those who are have, facing hard times that live in the area, and also you know missing middle housing, duplexes, triplexes, townhomes, and also. How will the dissolving of the Reedy Creek Improvement District affect Kissimmee and Osceola County's economy as a whole? It kind of looks, you know, not so good. I can cover those. Yeah, things. okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and cover those. So to the first part, uh, land preservation, the county has an adopted urban growth boundary where we're protecting 75% of the entire county in its rural setting. We have an environmental land save program where we bought over 3,000 acres to protect that side of things, that realm of it. Uh, with respect to mixed use housing and housing availability, uh, we have master planned over 50,000 acres down to street level of mixed use development, more so than I think any government in the country embedded into our comprehensive master plan that requires uh, the mixed use and the affordable housing and mass transit and a variety of things. It's, it's pretty unique in that regard. In the dissolving of the Reedy Creek Board, of which part of uh, Reedy Creek and Disney is in Osceola County, it will not affect us at all. First, it's got to say amazing presentation, and, um, and thank you for sharing your lessons learned with us. I'd like to know more about the first point, which was how did you get buy-in from the elected officials to, to support this? And I, I know how important that is. If you, you may have the best idea, but without their, their awareness, it doesn't go anywhere. Yes, yeah, so how did, it, it was uh, honestly, it was, it was two things, and luck was a part of it, right? I mean, there's just no doubt, doubt about it. So the experience was, is we did a master plan, we did a cluster study, and the first project that came forward, I think it was USSA, it was a 
amateur sports complex where they wanted us to build this $60 million facility, and some of my commissioners really loved the idea. And it didn't come to fruition because the business model didn't make sense, so we kind of put that one aside, got lucky there. Then came forward Beijing Construction Company that wanted to invest a billion dollars to build a, an Asian business-to-business -business market. On the same, we're still talking about Neo City, the same property, which used to be a dairy farm, by the way. Uh, and when that went, so the business, that didn't work out because Beijing pulled back on all of their investments internationally. Then came, we had Houston Astros spring training, and then came the Washington Nationals, which got before the county commission, and we negotiated for months. And billionaires are, are billionaires for a reason. Love the Lerner family, but uh, it got down to five minutes before the county commission meeting, a commissioner popped in my office and says, what do you think I should do? I was like, I'd vote no. Because it was, uh, it was 14 ball games at $160 million, which, you know, it's a neat thing to have, but so when the UCF and the Orlando Partnership came forward just a couple months after that and said, can we have 20 acres and $30 million? We're like, yeah, sure, that's the best idea because they want to build a semiconductor manufacturing fab, checks the box for the cluster study. It's a lot less money than any of these other things that we were negotiating. And we felt that even if the sensor facility didn't work out, that having the University of Central Florida in our community doing research and development, which is what they've been required to do, was better than not having it. Uh, so we looked at it as the as the win and all of it. So if I don't think if the other three things, those other three things happening before made the fourth one the easy sell, better sell. And and there's like five. We do we did a lot, bunch of research. We did five, like five different economic and fiscal analysis done by others to be sure that there's really growth and potential in the market. Yes, sir. I think you can probably hear me. From there. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Great presentation. Uh, can you talk to us about the strains on the utilities, water, electric, and also probably broadband? Which are, uh, no, that, that's a great question, too. So uh, particularly on that site, it is completely pad ready. Uh, we caused a $20 million substation to be built on site to meet the power needs. It has, a, there's a big pond on site that Toho Water Authority actually built that's got uh, all the reclaimed water. We have water sewer, ultra pure water sources. Uh, our biggest deficit, we've got a, a power, uh, and we've got a gas line out there too. The biggest deficit for us in manufacturing for the state of Florida, depending on which utility company you have, is our kilowatt hour cost. Uh, our KUA uh, charges 11 cents per kilowatt hour compared to Tennessee Valley Authority, which is where we, they could charge four cents a kilowatt hour. When you when you got, when you got something that costs millions of dollars a month in utility bills to manufacture, that is a huge deficit for Florida. And I think Florida needs to figure out a way to buy down those costs somehow through the uh, PSC or, or something. Uh, because it's always going to put us at a disadvantage for manufacturing. Yes. So my name is Marsha. I'm with the city of Fort Pierce. Thank you for that presentation. I think it was very enlightening. Um, in my experience in local government, I haven't seen projects to that degree, especially, like you said, in the state of Florida. But with that being said, um, my question is, um, so you talked a little bit about the free tuition program, which I thought was amazing. Um, I think it's a great way, especially in sometimes disenfranchised communities, to have an opportunity to kind of elevate families. Um, is there any intention or plans to somehow bring that talent back into the community? I know you talked about all the jobs that this opportunity creates, but retaining that talent, bringing them back, promoting the city in a way that attracts them if they're going into a career field that fits the, the new property. That, that's a great question. And, and really to the essence of one of the reasons why this was done was for that, that exact reason is that kids with talent, they go get a degree someplace else and they wouldn't come back. They go to you, you know, regardless of where it is, it doesn't matter when they were, where they went to school. So we're trying to get them to provide opportunities where they can stay within the community and raise families and be with their families and, and be a generational type of thing. So the thinking is that not only from, you know, most, a lot of these jobs don't require PhDs or college degrees, they require certifications. We've got advanced Valencia College Advanced Manufacturing Training Center, six weeks, three months, you can have a welding degree. Uh, and the, the indirect jobs as a result of semiconductor manufacturing is gonna create those opportunities for those folks. So 
we, we project at a minimum 4,000 direct jobs, 16,000 indirect. So lots of opportunity for people to get an education here and stay here. Sir, yeah. So I think uh, I agree with everybody. That was really, really impressive what your team was able to come up with and the presentation was excellent as well. I have a two part question for you. And the first part being, how did you approach the cluster analysis? It sounds like you had a lot of, that was kind of your initial kind of step in this. And so how did your team go about that and how long did that part of the process take? So that we went about, we did a solicitation like any local government does and got people to respond. It was about a six to nine month, from what I recall, it was about nine months to do the complete analysis. And they, they did uh, not only uh, readily available sources to collect the data, but they did a, a lot of interviews as well. It's 500 pages. If, honestly, if you have any interest in it at all, I would, I would be glad to share it with anybody in the room because it's, you know, it's geekier than I am when it comes to that, that type of stuff. What I was looking for, I saw the list of seven, and that's what I went after the seven, but there's a lot of analysis that went into it. And there's, there's, but there are, but universities do this too. So if you, if you like you say, if you want to find a, a, an affordable way to approach it, uh, and if you're close enough to Osceola, you could just steal ours and do the same thing. Unfortunately, not close enough to Osceola, okay. but that, that's, uh, that's uh, great information. I appreciate that. And uh, might take a gander at the 500-page report at sure. some point. Um, second part of my question is, so you ended up with semiconductors, which obviously was tremendous foresight given the world that we're living in now. So how did you, and I know you spoke about how that ended up kind of being option four and it was a blessing in disguise and all those things, but how, that, that seems like a relatively niche thing within the state of Florida to get semiconductors, and obviously it's taken off. So was that part of the cluster analysis? Was that part of one of the presentations you heard and you really liked the idea, or was that something that you guys were honing in on from the get-go as one of the potential uses? Another great question. The idea actually came forward in 2012 when a professor from the University of Central Florida and people from the Orlando Economic Partnership, our, our, our economic development group, went to Austin to find out what happened. And through that, they found out about Semitech. So in 2012, they started, Arduin Associates and, and others, uh, compiling economic analysis about the semiconductor industry and sensors about how it can grow an economy. Two years later, they bring it forward to Osceola, so we relied upon their two years' worth of work as the indicator that this would be the right lane for us to be in. The whole, we knew enough about semiconductors as well, and from Congress and being a U.S. issue, that its time was coming, although we had no idea that it was going to happen the way that it has. So you would think that we we're geniuses in all of this, but there's honestly just, you know, my personal belief, I think God's hand was in this, because I don't see any other way that this could have happened but without it. It's fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. This is my last question, I promise. So thinking through everything that you presented, are there any other major setbacks that you encountered? Because like you said, it takes a lot of time, and it's also a learning experience, right? So aside from the UCF situation and maybe some others, but any other major setbacks? Yeah, yeah, that's a... I'm really impressed by the question. So. When they came forward with the plan, it was going to be the county provides $30 million, and then they're going to get $125 million from the state, drawn down to $25 million a year for five years, and then they're getting another $25 million from the region. What, what I would look out for is as people are making you promises and they're elected officials, elected officials come and go, and a lot of that coming and going happens. So the money from the state never materialized, as was stated by members of both the House and the Senate at the time. That, that was one. And then what really happened with the University of Central Florida, whoever you're partnering with, we, from the time this started and toward this today, there's four UCF presidents that have been through the ring and the Board of Trustees changed. So having someone reliable and consistent that you can work with on these deals would be an important thing to keep an eye out for it. Uh, and then just the unrealistic expectation that the 5% has, right? We all have gadflies in the community. We all have those pointing us and you know the, I always like to use the man in the arena type of thing that we got all these critics out there that are telling us that, oh, this is the dumbest idea. And you know, there's people that post on social media all the time that I should be fired for, you know, my pet project. But if you stay persistent and just see it through 
you'll come out on the other side eventually. Anyway.